to state again, my name is Chris Swakako and I lead a ministry called the singlesnetwork.org. And it is a uh, the Wikipedia of singles ministry. It's the largest website in the world and how to start and grow your singles ministry. Um, I've been doing this for over 20 years. My heart is for singles. I was in a singles ministry in my 20s that literally made a difference in my life, that made a difference in, in whether I would have continued to follow God or followed myself. And because of that singles ministry and its impact on my life, um, it was very well structured, organized. Um, there was a plan. There was leadership training. Because of that, I learned from the best. And it would be another 10 years, though, after I left that group. And in that process of those 10 years, I became a part of a smaller church. And I would learn from the ground up. And I learned as I started helping other ministries, ministries I didn't even really felt called to be in, but felt the Lord telling me to be in it because God was molded and shaping me and getting me ready to start singles ministry on my own. And so the next 10 years, I would work at different churches and uh, as a volunteer and, and everywhere that I went, I kept starting ministries and I'd start it, train people and let go, start it, train and let go. And I realized that I really wasn't a manager. I'm more of a motivator and equipper and a trainer. And I love giving it away. And I know some of you may go, really? You know, because I like to control too. I like, I like being in charge. But no, I do. I really love to give it away. But I don't want to give it away till I feel the people that I give it to are equipped and ready to take it on. Then I love staying in touch with people and seeing how they're doing and, and continue to encourage them and offer them training and resources to help them keep doing what they're doing. Because you don't have a baby and leave it on the doorstep. You know, when you grow people in the Lord, you want to continue to grow them. You want to continue to pour into them. And so, um, so I did the same thing. And then about 20 some years ago, I was working with Campus Crusade. I was a affiliate staff with them and I had gotten training all over the world. I had uh, served underneath different pastors. I had, um, you know, done greeter ministry and Sunday school ministry and was teaching Bible studies and uh, God called me to take over a ministry called the Singles Network, which was a Campus Crusade ministry. And in the beginning, it was just to network people. It was to network churches, provide some training. And we put on one big event a month called Believer's Community. And that's kind of where it started. And then God would continually start to change it. And for, for I know I started getting phone calls from different churches around the country. And I started going out and helping other people. In the past 20 years, I have done contract staff with over 15 churches where I've started ministry, grown ministry. And so I am i wouldn't say I'm a total expert at all of it. I don't know everything. I'm still learning. I'm still, you know, absorbing and, and, and talking to people who've been doing it longer than me. But I think I've got a pretty good handle on how to start singles ministry and how to grow it. And I'm hoping after today, you'll have one more thing that you'll know better, which is our socials. And why are we doing them? So I mentioned that I did Believer's Community, which was this monthly gathering um, for singles. We had a band, we had music. I mean, we had, oh, band is music. Uh, we had a teacher, we had fellowship. And, um, and so what made it so successful was that it was structured. It was strategic. There was a purpose behind it. There were people praying. We made sure that's what we needed to do. And after X amount of years, um, it changed. We, we moved it to a different church and X amount of years, it changed. We moved it to another church and, and then finally it had done its thing and it had produced all the fruit it was going to produce and it was time to let it go. That's one of the things about socials is, and, and our ministries is when is God telling us it's time to make changes? When is it time to let something go? Or just because it's always been done doesn't mean you got to keep doing it if it's not effective. So we named this, hello, my name is, I've got my lovely name tag here because I really love name tags and I think they're very important. And I wasn't going to share about this, about name tags, but I thought it'd be, be kind of fun is why do we put the name tag um, on our right shoulder? Uh, because most people handshake, obviously with their right hands. I know some of you lefties are like, it's not fair. Um, but when you handshake somebody, your eye naturally flows up and it goes to this part of your body. When our name tags are put over our heart, people have to visually move their eye across our chest. It's not as easy to do. So we always want to put our name tag over here so it's easier for people to see our name. We want a really big first name 
and either no last name or a small last name because we don't want people to have to go like this to find or to read your name. And you definitely don't want to write it in pencil or pen, definitely a magic marker. But here's another thing about name tags and about refreshments and just a little sidebar. When we go into a new environment, when we go to a, um, you know, a gathering at someone's home or a gathering at the church or pretty much gathering anywhere, um, we offer snacks most of the time. And I know a lot of people get, a lot of people blame, you know, tease uh, Christians that we're always eating. And why are we always eating? Well, because it makes people feel safe. See, when someone has something in their hands, here's an example. If I have my coffee cup in my hand and I go to handshake, I'm blocking my most, most sensitive area. It's, I call it my bubble. I'm blocking my space. And I can give you a handshake and I'm saying, I don't know you yet, so I'm gonna greet you and say hello, but I'm gonna still keep this space protected. If I walk around and I've already greeted everybody and then I have a snack, let's say I have a sandwich and it's on a plate and I have my cup, I'm also protecting myself. But when I don't have anything, I have nothing here and I'm kind of walking around like this, I've made myself vulnerable and I'm uncomfortable and I don't know what to do with my hands. I don't necessarily want a handshake or acknowledge I'm not quite there yet. So food gives people safety. So it's not so much that we're, gosh, do we ever not have an event with food? Yes, I get that about the food, but you don't have to you know, always have something unhealthy. The point is, is that people need to be able to put something in their hand and choose when they wanna take that out of their hand and let it down when they feel comfortable and safe so that they would uh, uh, you know, give you a big hug and say, hey, come on in and that kind of thing. So next time you have an event, look at people's body language, look at how they're holding their cups of food or their plate of food in their cups and see the ones that start to put it down and see the changes or they sit it on their chair so they can greet. And you'll notice those are the ones that are most comfortable, that have felt the most security, safety, and it definitely should be your leaders. And uh, but that's just a little sidebar. So let's get going with the outline. And like I said, you got a question, put it in the Q and A. You got a comment. You got, hey, you know, uh, I you know got a great resource. You can put that in the side chat. But either way, we'll find you, find your information. Um, so I made a comment in the in the description of this webinar that anybody can order KFC or uh, a pizza and have a social. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot of brain cells to pick up the phone, order pizza. Hey, people come over. Um, but if you want to see growth. If you want your numbers to go up, if you want your maturity to go up among the people that are there, then you need a plan. Because we know in singles ministry, um, healthy singles get married, healthy singles move to other parts of the church, and healthy singles just move. And what you're left with are a few healthy ones that choose to be in your singles ministry or Sunday school class or small group, and all the unhealthy ones that never leave. Now, some of the unhealthy ones could get healthy Maybe they just need a little extra care. Maybe they need time and <clears throat> to get over a divorce that they're really struggling, or maybe they're taking care of an elderly parent, or maybe they've had a sickness. Those are not the ones I'm talking about. Those are the ones that just need some time. But they're the unhealthy ones that never seem to get healthy, never change. And if you don't balance out your ministry with healthy, eventually all the unhealthy take over. So that's why our socials, our events, uh, and when I use the word social, I'm meaning anything, any type of event, any type of gathering, anything beyond your Bible study uh, where people fellowship. So I'm just going to use that word as a blanket and you'll know what I mean. So I don't have to keep mentioning all the other words. Okay. <clears throat> so let me ask you a question. Do you remember when you're a kid playing and you're playing with other kids and maybe you're at your grandma's house or you're in the neighborhood. And like in my time, we went outside and we played for hours and nobody worried about kids getting kidnapped and but you would play and play and play. And the games that were really good, you played over and over. Hide and seek, tag. Uh, I used to play Mother May I and Red Rover and climb trees or, or, or games that you would play. You play with your Barbies, you play Army Men or your know, Hero or, you know, um, or Monopoly, Uno. Uno is always a game that everybody loves, right? But then occasionally you'd suggest a game. Occasionally, even like Uno, um, or when you're a kid, you go, Hey, let's do this play tag. Let's do this. And people will make that comment like, Oh, we always do that. What does that mean? We always do that. 
it means they're bored. It means that you've repeated something to the point to where it's lost its interest. It's lost its challenge. Something's not good anymore about it. And so that's what's ha- that's what happens in our ministries, in our small groups. We get bored because sometimes we do the same thing over and over and there's nothing, there's, we don't even know why we're doing it. There doesn't seem to be a value. There doesn't seem to be any interest. There doesn't seem to be inclusion where, not inclusion, but uh, input. Like there's nobody else helping. It's the same handful of people doing all the work. So that's a time when it's time to evaluate and go, are we really doing this? Um, Now I know as we get older, I know as we get older, a lot of senior singles, their idea of excitement is to pick a different restaurant. Um, They're not so much, you know, want to play, you know, Uno at a house for 14 hours or, you know, go outside and, and go on a long hike, you know. But even among senior singles, I know they love the occasional road trip to a different restaurant, maybe in a different city, or maybe there's a gospel group that's playing, or, you know, maybe there's some helping uh, ministry, helping hands ministry. So I even know among senior singles that are able physically and mobile also like to do different things and would love to see more people do it. They, you know, the more people you're around, the the more energy it creates and, and that's fun. So why do we have events then? Why do we have socials at all? What is the point to them? Well, the social's primary purpose is to connect people in your class. That's that's the primary purpose. Uh, in your small group or uh, ministry, you do it because you're trying to connect people that already are there, already go to it, already are part of it, have been coming on a regular basis. Um, but understand all socials, all activities should come as a result of a foundation that you put in meaning it comes out of a Bible study, out of a small group, out of a Sunday school class. A lot of singles ministries want to build their ministry based on socials first. I get phone calls from a lot of women that are like, ah, my kids are gone, my husband, I'm divorced, and I just need something to do on a Friday night, so I'm going to start a singles ministry. It doesn't work that way. Now, if you want something to do on Friday night, then gather up a bunch of your friends and, you know, and go do stuff, but don't call it a ministry. A ministry has a plan. A ministry has strategy. A ministry is what I call a strategic fellowship. A ministry has leaders. A ministry is watching where those leaders are going. A ministry is going to follow up. A ministry is going to make sure people have name tags so that we know who's there. A ministry is going to have people sign up so that we, again, can track who's there. Because we want to help grow people in the Lord. And I can't help you when I don't even know who's there. So, Building a ministry where you do just fun stuff is not a ministry. That's called a club. And if that's what you want as a dinner club, then you do that. But as a Christian, I'm called to do more than just socials where they're just whatever. Now, do I have some friends that we pick up the phone and say, hey, we're going to go out to dinner. Let's go. Yeah, it's, it's not a ministry. We're just going out to dinner. But when I actually have things where I have people come help me and we set up, and then it's strategy. And I'm actually giving instruction and giving direction on what we're doing because we want to be able to measure it. We want to make sure that people feel safe when they're there and feel protected when they're there. We want the quiet ones, that someone to talk to them. We want the loners to let them know we, we love that they're there. And I definitely don't want all my leaders in a holy huddle clustered together to sit on one end of the table at the Mexican restaurant. I want them spread out so they can listen in on the conversations and hear what people are saying about their lives. <clears throat> When our class is healthy, when our small group is healthy, um, this is what's going to create a healthy social. Um, We want our classrooms, we want our small groups to be healthy. We, from a healthy group will come a healthy strategic fellowship. But when our classes are not healthy, when they're weird and dysfunctional and inconsistent and no one's following up, there's no unity. And then when you have a social that doesn't work out, you can typically look back and go, wow, I tried to create something from nothing. So keep that in mind as you guys are planning. Ezra 3.11 says, and they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to God. Now hear that. They sang responsibly. It means they were listening to what was being said, praising God, giving thanks to God. That's worship, you know. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. 
when the right foundation is there, when your class is growing, when your class is structured, your class is healthy, your group is healthy, there's uh, a strategicness in your small group, in your ministry, as a result of that, people are going to praise God, people are going to worship God, and people are going to want to get together outside of their Sunday school class or their ministry to do things because they begin to see that it's not about them and they begin to see now it's a strategic fellowship and it's going to have purpose and it's going to help grow our class. So here's some more reasons why we have socials. We want to allow members to interact with people outside the class. I, I'm, I'm happy to get to know the people in, which is good to get to know in the class because I can get to know maybe some of their families and, you know, maybe I have a cookout at somebody's house and they invite their sister or they invite their mother who lives with them or they invite their kids and we can get to know them. And that's great to expand our, you know, to get to know more people in our class, but we also do them to get to know people outside of our class. Um, maybe extended family members, um, maybe your neighbors, maybe someone that you work with. This is even somebody that's lost. Understand, um, social strategic fellowships are a great way, it's a soft, easy, safe way to bring someone lost into our ministry, into our church. They may come to a social way before they come to your Sunday school class or your small group because they're lost. Uh, church to them is, ooh. but if you said, hey, there's a bunch of us going to a movie tonight or, hey, there's a bunch of us going to go hike. And you don't have to say it's First Baptist. You don't have to say it's, you know, fusion singles ministry or whatever. You can just say how yeah, much of us are going hiking. And the point of that is that you, you know it's strategic. You know what you're doing. You know why you're inviting them because you're hoping to get to know them, to get to know a little bit about them and to let them see that Christians are all not, all of us are not weird and strange. And they begin to go, wow, these are some really nice people. I really enjoyed this. And so understand, so that's where the part becomes strategic. It's not just your Sunday school class having a cookout, your ministry going on a hike, but there's purpose behind it. Because we're, remember, our entire purpose in life is a relationship with God and have that relationship that glorifies him, a relationship with other people to bring them to Christ. Everything we do has to have that mindset. So even if you go to dinner with your four or five friends, you still need to have that mindset. You still need to have the mindset that I'm here with my five friends. Can I encourage them? Can I support them? Can we tip our waitress really good? Can we witness to our waitress? Can we pray together as a group of friends? There's still strategy because even among your little group of friends, you're trying to grow each other in the Lord. Iron sharpens iron. So always keep that mentality. Otherwise, what's the purpose? You know, what's the purpose? And so we're going to talk a bit more about that later. So the more we know each other, the more we bond. The more we bond, the stronger our ministry becomes. Um, socials, just like singles ministry, is not the end. It's just a gate for people to come through. That, a gate that they might not come another way. Singles ministry is the same. It's not an end. We don't bring people into singles ministry, our, our Sunday school classes, and that's where they stay. We bring them in to, you know, to create the connection, to get them to Jesus, to help grow them in the Lord, to help get them healthy. Maybe some of them will end up being leaders, and then some of them won't. They may go on to other classes. They may get married. They may move. But if we've helped them to get healthier, then we're going to help somebody else when they go to the next ministry. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, without strategy, our socials or events, you're just ordering pizza. So we need to be strategic in our goals for our, our socials and our purpose of why, why are we having it? What's the point? Um, in a way that we position our leadership. And plus, we need a way to track who's been there. Proverbs 21, 15 says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. You hear that? The plans of the diligent. Diligent is intentional, strategic, purposeful, uh, leads to abundance, abundance in numbers, abundance in um, relationships, abundance in spiritual growth, because numbers is not, you know, the only way to measure growth. We all know that. But everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. People who are not planners, people who just throw this together, whatever. Um, and I'm not saying that the last minute you guys don't, you know, put sit out on a social media, hey, we're all going to the movies, or hey, we're all going to go for a walk. But even in that, you need to be aware of who's coming. You need to be aware of the people that, that, that maybe they invited. You need to float around as a leader and talk to different people that you don't know. You need to acknowledge them because, one, you're acknowledging them because people like to be acknowledged. 
they like it when someone says, well, hey, Chris, you know, hey, Pamela, hey, Eileen. And you're like, oh, hi, it's nice to meet you. But also I'm doing it to watch the door. I want to know who's coming into this ministry. I want to know a little bit about them. I want to know why they're there. I'm very protective of my ministry, right? And you should be protective of yours because the enemy does sheep, you know, a dove, he's the wolf in sheep's clothing. We know that. So we have to be very careful and watch what comes in and aware of what, you know, what's going on in our ministries. So here's a few other reasons uh, we do socials. Well, they should be fun and enjoyable, right? Have you ever been to one that's not? Have you ever been to a gathering at someone's house and it's lame? There's no good music. The food's terrible. The, it's unorganized. The way they've set up the food is terrible. There's nobody doing anything. You can't find anywhere to park, you know, and, and it's ugh, crazy. Uh, no, they're supposed to be fun and enjoyable. They should promote relationships within the church. Uh, when you do an icebreaker, uh, table discussion, game activity, road trip, mission trip, all of these are to help promote relationships in the church. Um, I love icebreakers. You guys, a lot of you know that I'm an icebreaker fanatic. I've got, um, uh, I sell a, a couple hundred of them online on my website. And it's just, I, the reason I love icebreakers is because it gives people permission to go talk to somebody they would never normally talk to. And for the, for the uh, you know, two out there that hate it, we just tell you to just stay seated. It doesn't bother us. But we know people want an excuse to go talk to that person. Um, you know, maybe you, you meet somebody and they've also been divorced. Maybe you've met somebody and they're also from Ohio. Maybe you've met somebody and they're also a singer. You don't know without an opportunity for that to happen. So our icebreakers do that. And of course, you know, also they're a really cute guy you want to meet. <laughs> That's another talk. Uh, but then table discussions is a great way to, again, get to know somebody a little bit more and to find out more about their story. Um, road trips and mission trips also help people. So these are all uh, fellowship type things that allow us to get to know people because there's a strategy behind it. We're getting to know them because, one, we want to see where they are spiritually. So we know what our part is. Do we need to lead them to the Lord? Do we need to help lead them to the Lord? Um, do we need to get them to resources in our churches? Do they need celebrate recovery, divorce recovery? Um, do they just need a friend? Uh, or maybe they've got leadership background and skills and we want to use them in that way. Also, your socials should promote team building. When you work together and create and are building an activity, you're building a team. And so, um, you know, teamwork helps grow any ministry. And so we, we do this, like if you have a, a cookout at someone's house, there's a team of people that put it on and a team of people that clean up. You know, if you're going to go <laughs> on a road trip or do a mission trip, there's a team that organizes it and does the marketing and does the prayer. So all of this, uh, it looks like a social, but it's actually building your team. Uh, recently, and some of you guys know this that are on, that are watching, uh, we have our big annual retreat that we do over there uh, at LaborDaySingles.org. And uh, we had to cancel it this year due to, to the COVID, but uh, we're already planning next year and excited. And so we look at that and I look at my team and I have the most amazing team uh, that helps put, the, put it on. And there's no way, there's no way that we could do what we do without an incredible amount of leaders. We have like 20 leaders and another 40 or 50 volunteers or even, probably even more. <laughs> and I value every one of these people, but we didn't have the event this year and people were kind of bummed and I was bummed, but I realized that the event comes once a year, but these relationships with these people, I have these relationships every day. So don't get so focused on the social that you also forget about the relationships of the people who help you put it on, because that's just as important in the strategy of your social as the social. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10, it says, two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. This is the importance of socials. We know, like I said, it's a gateway for some people, but it's also a way for people to feel relaxed and connected to someone else. And they're not alone. I think the biggest struggle with doing online ministry uh, in the last few months is that we still feel alone. And even though like, even right now with this webinar, you're not able to interact other than chat with each other, but I want you to know that you're not alone. And we, you know, you guys can email me or text me if I can help you. And I'm sure the rest of you are the same way. We don't want anybody to feel alone because the enemy wants to do that to you. He wants to get you by yourself. So what's great about this workshop is that 
we're going to also talk about some online ways that you can connect and also have that uh, strategy, but also that fellowship, because we know that this, you know, uh, we'd love to all have tons of socials again. We love to be doing things again every weekend, but not everybody can, depending on what part of the country you're in, but it still doesn't mean you can't social, socialize. Um, the other one, a few reasons, is they promote outreach. When you're working well as a team uh, within the church, you're ready to go and reach the people outside. You're ready to evangelize. So the more organized you are as a class, as a, as a mis- ministry, the more organized you are when you do your socials, because you know your socials are to grow your members, reach uh, lost people, reach other people you haven't seen in a while, because ultimately you want to reach the world for Christ. Mark 16, 15 says, and he said to them, go to all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So socials are just the beginning step on what God can do in each person's life to help them go beyond their, their own little circle of friends. Um, so what happens, though, when your socials are not fun anymore? Uh, they're boring. People say they're boring. Oh, you've already done that. It's not much fun. Or your numbers start to drop off and you're not really sure why. Or uh, people say, oh, they, oh, I hope we're going to have the dinner this weekend, but then they don't show up. Or, yeah, yeah, I want to do this and this and this. And you do a survey and they mark all these things they want to do and you plan them and they don't show up. I'm sure uh, a lot of you can relate to that one because I'm the same way. I have a rule when I plan a social that um, I don't plan anything that I don't want to do by myself because I might be by myself. Um, Now, if I really want to do the event, like I've planned a hiking event coming up and uh, I planned it with a friend of mine, Michelle, and uh, she's one of my leaders and we're going to go hiking no matter if anybody shows up or not because we want to go hiking. That's the cool thing too. Make sure whatever you do that it is exactly what God wants you to do. But we're going to talk a little bit more in detail of that um, because we're not just talking about a hike where, you know, you can go hiking by yourself, but we're talking about when you plan events where you're going to need a team of people, um, a strategy or go to a restaurant and you've got a table that seats 25. We need to have strategy when we plan those. Um, What happens when there's lack of enthusiasm? People are there, but they don't seem to be like engaged or you have an event at a house and they sit on the couch and they never leave. They stay in that one spot the whole night. Or when it's the same people doing all the work, they, all, they do all the setup, all the cleanup, and there's nobody else doing anything. There's, there's, there's a key there. Nobody else is doing anything. So here's some questions to ask. Um, what is the purpose behind your social? Is it something we feel we need or we're called to do? Uh, or is it just a couple people that want it? Well, this classroom has socials, so we should have socials, Okay. Well, are you sure it's what God wants you to have? How's the healthiness of your class, your ministry? Are you ready to do it? Do you understand what a social's for? It's to reach lost people. It's to grow the group, but it's also to reach lost people. It's a gateway. Do you get that's what it is? It's not a little holy huddle of just your people and a little click, although we need things for that too. But we should always be thinking outward. We're trying to reach the world for Christ. So you want to have this event, but do you really get the reasoning behind it and the strategy that needs to be in it? Probably not. Have we involved others to help using their ideas and gifts and talents? Um, Have I met with them and and shared the vision, my vision, or the vision of the class and hear their ideas? You know, the key is to meet with people personally, not just fill out a survey, but to say, okay, I see on the survey that you marked that you like to hike. Tell me about that. Oh, you know, I just occasionally like, you know, and you look at them and they don't look like they're in shape. And you're like, how many hikes have they been doing? And you come to find out they've never hiked. They have no idea that, you know, a hike is seven, eight, 10 miles. So then you, you peel away the layer and you go, well, what would you really like to do? Well, I just want to get outside and do something fun outside. Well, let's talk about what that would look like. Well, maybe we could just go to a park and bring our dogs and our, and our kids and, you know, okay. So you're not going to know that unless you peel away the layers and start talking to people and really find out. And then you say, well, um, how about, would you be willing to help us lead this? What does that involve? What do you have a job description? Are you strategic? Do you, you know, if you're going to be in charge of this event, what does that look like? Or if you're going to help with it, can you get there early? Can you get a picnic table set up? Can you go get a grill? Can you bring these food items? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So understand we get frustrated when people sign up and say, I want to do all these things and we plan them and they don't come to them because it's just an interest. There's no really ownership. There's no real investment. 
So I'm leery of doing surveys that just kind of blanket it all. I would rather meet with people individually, even by Zoom and saying, what would you like to do? What would you like to do? Maybe right now you have to do smaller group outings because of COVID. I don't know. But find out what people really want to do and see if there's enough interest and enough ownership and enough maturity that people will start it, grow it. They will connect with people that are there. They will help clean up because otherwise you're going to get burned out and then you're not going to want to do them at all. And then the enemy wins because socials can be a powerful tool to use to reach the lost. Other questions you need to ask is, have I been willing to try different things, change, be creative, do something different. Okay, we go to a restaurant, but let's do something different in the restaurant. Or, you know, let's do a appetizer hop instead and where we, we go from restaurant to restaurant to restaurant and just order an appetizer and then go to the next restaurant. You know, let's, let's, let's do a backwards progressive dinner. You know, let's change it up and do something different so it's not always so boring and the same old same. Um, have a, are we evaluating the socials to see what is expected? That what, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Are we evaluating the socials to see if what we've done was what was expected? If people said, oh, we had a paint party and, and it wasn't what I thought we were going to do. What happened? What did you think? Come to find out you didn't have a really good description uh, about it when you advertised it and people are, were misled. Or you had game night and people think, oh, we're just going to come and play Uno and come to find it's some game that your grandma invented 100 years ago and you want everybody to do it. Be very clear in your communication of what things are so that your expectations will be met. Um, do you see fruit in your socials? Are people talking, connecting, getting to know each other? Or are they finding their spot and they're not moving? We have a tendency to do that. But again, if they're strategic, you should encourage movement. You should encourage people not to sit in the same place, not to sit beside the same people. You encourage them to go and try to meet as many people as possible. And that's why icebreakers are great. So it makes you, it forces you to go get up off your butt and go talk to people, okay? Um, are your socials, uh, your events too expensive um, to where some people can never go, which is not bad because sometimes, you know, I don't want to always have to eat at McDonald's and, and let the kids play in the little play area. I, I like to do things that might cost a little bit more. Maybe a concert's $30 a ticket, or maybe you're going to go whitewater rafting. It's $100 and you have to save up. But also, if they're always too expensive, you've eliminated people. But if they're free, nobody values them. And they know that they can sign up at the last minute. No big deal. Um, is there anything prohibiting people from attending the socials? Um, if, you know, like Graham is watching this, Graham is in a wheelchair. And, you know, we've had to think about that every year. We do a prayer experience in our big Labor Day retreat. And we, people said, well, why don't you do part of it upstairs in the gym? And I said, because Graham can't get upstairs. So you have to think about, what you're planning, is it limiting people from being able to come? And, and is the place that you're having at would limit somebody that's physically handicapped or somebody who is, you know, has mobile issues or has a lot of kids and they can't bring all their kids. We got one of our singles has like eight kids and he has to be very careful where he takes his kids, you know? So be thinking about that. Um, what would other people say about your socials? They're really fun. They're really good. They hear through the grapevine. They're like, oh my goodness, these guys do so many incredible things. They're helping the community. They're involved. I see lives changing. My friend came to it. She loved it. Now she joined the Sunday school class. Or are they saying nothing? Nothing. Are you enjoying the socials? If, if it, would your social be something that somebody would tell somebody about? Would they post on Facebook? That's a measure for me. I want to see ownership. I want to see people post pictures of our retreats, our socials, our hiking, our gatherings, our dinners. Now, granted, not everybody is a photo person like me. I take pictures all the time. Um, and, but if you did put pictures, would somebody comment on it? Would somebody want to tag somebody that creates energy? But also you have to be strategy, strategic, is you have to have a handful of people that are willing to post. We have people um, in our big retreat take photos throughout the whole weekend, put them in a drop folder, and then we do a slideshow at the end. But also the reason why we do that is because we want to use it as marketing for the next year. See, there's strategy. It's not just taking a bunch of photos. We want people to see what we're doing because here's the thing. <clears throat> if I'm coming to something for the first time, I want to go online through your website or Facebook and I want to see, are there people that look like me there? Are there people that look like my age? Does it look like it's things that I want to do? And it is what it is. And so I'd rather people just see, 
we get people all the time that say, well, you know, what's the age group of your ministry? And I'll tell them, but I say, listen, just go on and look at our pictures and you can see if those people look like, like you. Most of the time, it's not just that they look like you, but are we doing things that I'd want to do? Do they look like they're having fun um, and that I would fit in? Um, are your socials too often or not enough? Having something once a month um, is really difficult to create a connection, to create a momentum. So I always suggest you have a Bible study every week or Sunday school. That's one. The first Sunday, maybe go to lunch. Now, singles typically go to lunch every week because, you know, you don't want to go home, you know. But strategy-wise, maybe have the first Sunday be strategy where you intentionally invite new people and you pay for them, you know. And, and so that's a strategy. So you have a first Sunday, a first lunch Sunday, and then you might have a, a game night somewhere in the month, and then you might do a service project. So there's a higher chances of connection um, of people being a part of the ministry, but it's not just – you know, again, it looks like game night, but you've got your leaders spread out. You, you're looking for new people and you're intentionally inviting people to come. Um, are you praying as a class about your socials? Probably should have been the first one, huh? Making sure people know what they're, de- what they're designed for, why we're doing them. Are you praying to see if, if this is even what the Lord wants you to do? Just because other people are doing it doesn't mean you should be doing it. Um, are you sure if your folks want to even have a social? Um, you can give out a survey, but I really like to ask individually. Uh, I think it's better to talk to people one-on-one um, because a lot of times what they put on a survey is not what they're going to say in person. Um, also, are you training people to know how to start conversations as socials, how to build relationships? Are you training them to evangelize? Are you training leaders? Um, remember I was telling you about how I like to spread out my leaders. So when they go to dinner, maybe you have a table of 20 or something. I don't know if you today, but maybe I love my leaders to be every three people. Understand that when we start a conversation at a big table, we only talk to typically three people around us, the one in front of us, one here, one here, or the over here. You don't really talk. A group of five doesn't talk. So what happens is two cluster, then three cluster. So I have my leaders every three because I want them to be the ears and eyes of the ministry. I want them to listen to the conversation for things that are alarming or concerning. Um, the same thing we do breakouts. We don't do more than five in a breakout. Um, we you know have a four, have the one person that leads it and then the other four because it Again, conversation-wise, it doesn't work as well. Um, We want to be able to hear from every person and hear their heart and also bring an alarm if there's something concerning, if somebody says something concerning, but also so that everybody gets a chance to chit-chat. So I have my leaders spread out, and I train my leaders to to listen for things, um, to be watchful for things. Same thing with greeters. Are your greeters being trained? Do they understand, even at an event? You know, I love to get up and walk around, and, and when we go to dinner and talk to each person that's there and acknowledge them and touch them on the shoulder or give them a hug. Um, I want them to know they're welcome. If you're having a, a barbecue at someone's house, are your leaders walking around and watching and looking and starting conversations and putting their chair with this group and then getting up and putting their chair with this group? Some of you might have noticed that about a month ago, I had a social at my house and I got up and I moved around because I want to meet lots of people. I want to, you know, everyone to feel as welcome as I can into the ministry. I don't want us to get into what's called a holy huddle. Um, remember, giving out water bottles in the park may be fun. But wouldn't it be great if everyone in the class could start a conversation um, that included Christ? Now, now that you um, that you have to have lead every person to the Lord. I mean, sometimes you just start a conversation. But you know, giving out water bottles is great, or giving out food to the homeless is great. But wouldn't it be wonderful if they were trained to go to the next level? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you know, even when people are out with their friends uh, and had nothing to do with your ministry, that they would know how to share their faith? Well, that's called strategy. You have to train people to do that. And then you have to follow up and then you have to ask them how it went. And then you have to uh, give them more training. Um, Years ago, I developed this thing. I I call it urban ministry. And because one of my pet peeves, when I go around to different churches working with them, they always had a nursing home ministry. Yep, our so our our strategic, you know, our outreach is we go, you know, minister to old people in a nursing home. And I hate doing that. I'll be honest with you. I don't like it. It smells and they're old. It's just not my ministry. And to tell me as an entire singles ministry, that's what we're going to do, I don't think is right. I think in order to have the best return on what you're doing is to have people do what they're interested in. 
Um, so why not have an arts class, an art circle for people who are an artist and, and intentionally invite people that are lost to come to it? Why not have a walking club? Why not have a, a, a hiking club? Why not have a bicycling club? Why not have a knitting club? Having, and I say club, I shouldn't use the word club, but ministry, uh, strategic social, where it looks like you've invited all the knitters together, but you know strategically you invited lost people to come. And so it doesn't look like a Christian event. It's just a bunch of people gathering that have something in common. But as time goes on, the goal is to get those lost people to the Lord. Um, it takes time, but that's the strategy behind it. I would much rather join an art circle, go on a hiking group, and invite someone else that is lost that wants to go on a hiking group or someone that's young in their faith or struggling than to be forced to get a nursing home and, and smell what I have to smell. I'm not going to, it's just not my wheelhouse. And so I would rather come up with things that people want to do because they're interested in it, even if it's a four or five people than when it's, you know, 30 people and most of them don't want to be there. So here's some basic elements to help you. And there are times uh, getting uh, a little ahead of us here. It says, make sure there's real interest and a lot of people to take ownership a team, meaning uh, they get the purpose of it and they want to be a part of the purpose. They, they get it. They understand. They see the fruit. They see how it helps. Um, make sure wherever you're going, it's easy to get to distance and direction. Um, if you're going to do, uh, you know, a trip somewhere, then make sure that there's buses or vans or that it's easy for people to to go. Um, if the if the uh, we were talking about our hike next weekend and um, we were trying to figure out places and I go, you know what, I can't even tell people how to find some of these places. So we picked a place that's on the map. Um, because again, we want it to be easy for people to get there because if they can't find it, they, they don't come back. Okay. Or if they can't park, they don't know where to park because someone hasn't organized the parking and they don't know where to put their food when they get there, or they don't know where to sit when they get there, or they don't know who to talk to. We want to make it easy. Okay. Um, make sure the cost fits within the budget. Um, think about people have kids. Think about people with disabilities. Remember time management, um, you know, make, make sure the time is manageable that you don't have to rush to get there, rush to get back, you know, um, you must. Uh, you need to cl have clear communication through social media and your website, and flyers, and person in person emails. You know what kind of social is it? Is it just for our class, or is it open to outsiders, including those who are not Christians? Remember, when you do strategic fellowships and you invite lost people, this is very, very important. Be careful of Christianese. You know. Hey, y'all. We're just gonna fellowship in the Lord because Jesus is is our Savior, and we love him. You just lost a lost person completely. Now they're they're lost already once, but they're really lost now. Be careful that we don't use terminology that a lost person has no idea what we're talking about. I'm not saying be the world, but I'm saying be aware of that. Also be aware that when you invite people that are lost and you have a, a dinner at a restaurant, they may order alcohol, or you may be a part of a church that's okay with alcohol. Um, I have a rule in my, in my ministry that no one is a leader is to, drinks. I ask them not to drink at all as a part of being a part of leadership. Now, what they do privately in their home, I can't control. But when they're out in a group, we want to set a model. We want to be an example. And we would never want anybody to fall spiritually. Um, but we do know that people may come and, and, and have a drink at a restaurant. Now, you can control a barbecue at someone's house. You can control we're going hiking and no alcohol, but you can't always control it in a restaurant. Um, when you communicate in your marketing, who are your leaders? Who do they contact? Um, <clears throat> and your leaders need to be available. I've had, I've done ministries over the years where people are like, well, you can put my, my number, but I never, I never answer my phone. Okay. Or I'm not on Facebook, but yet the whole ministry is on Facebook. So, but they're not on Facebook. Well, they're probably not going to be a good leader for you, at least not in that area. Um, what should they wear? What should they bring? <clears throat> Who should, what should they expect? I need a little coffee there. What's the cost? What are the directions to get there? Where do they park? How do they register online or in person? Is there a deadline? Um, is there childcare? Can I bring my pet? Is there a carpool? Where are they meeting to ride together? How am I going to get back from the carpool? Um, is ordering, is ordering alcohol allowed? Um, do you need more help? Is there value for them to come? There has to be a value or a motivation for people to come. With singles, um, it's other singles. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but with single parents or marrieds, it may be just getting a break. 
Now, I know not everybody that's watching this is single. Some of you are married. Some of you lead ministry as a married person or you're a married pastor. Um, and so we know you may come to a social because you just need a break. Maybe you need a break from the kids. Maybe you need a break from work or whatever. But singles typically are motivated because they think other singles are going to be there. So understand that there's no value. It was the same old people doing the same old thing. Well, I wouldn't want to go either, Right. And I'll be honest with you, I've, I've got some ministries close to me and I know the kind of people that are there and I don't want to be, I don't want to go because I know who's going to be there. And that's their problem because they haven't done anything in their ministry to change that. And it's just the same three people doing all the work and the same 20 show up that do nothing. Will they learn something they need to know? Will they draw closer to God? Will they make new friends? When you're at the event, make sure they wear a name tag, provide an easy way to check in, drop off food, get their name tag, pay money, childcare, where to meet. Make sure your leaders do not sit together. Greeters are needed for all events. They're the eyes and ears of your ministry. They also can be your security, watching out for things. Ask open-ended questions. Take time to get to know people. Listen to their stories. Offer prayer. Network. Um, be organized, start on time and end on time when you need to, but also have flexibility in that. Um, recently, uh, <clears throat> a gentleman was saying that our Wednesday night Bible studies are, have gotten late, later than normal. And I said, you know, anytime people can just off, you know, uh, but if we're teaching the word and people are responding, you're doing a Bible study and people are responding and people's lives are changing and people are getting healing and people are needing prayer. Don't end, keep going. But if you find you're rambling and people are complaining and saying there's nothing getting done and you're just rambling and rambling, and rambling then that's that's the evaluation part where you go, maybe we do need to cut this. So we have a thing called after chat because we know people want to just talk about their lives and things that are happening. So you you say we're going to teach from kind of this time to this time and then and then we're going to do after chat so that some people know, OK, it's going to end at this time and I can be done. And then if I want to stay on, I can. Do the same thing with all of your socials. Have an end time, especially if it's at your house and you're like, listen, I don't want to be up to three in the morning cleaning up. So say it ends at 10, clean up. And then by 1130, they're all gone. But you might have a few hanging out. But having a start in time will probably be good for you. Make sure people have what they need for the event. The resources, get guests or new folks info so you can get follow up with them. Have them sign up something, uh, a little bit about their information so you can follow up. Watch for those who are alone socially disconnected or could cause problems. Ask people you know um, and don't know for help. I, I, I'm a big what's called volunteer you. I'll ask you to do something just to see what you do because I'm looking for more volunteers. I'm looking for more people to get involved. And I think people just wanna be asked. Um, ask for feedback of your event so you can do it better next time. Um, maybe end the event with a door prize for people who fill out an evaluation as a motivation to fill out the evaluation. Meet with your team to evaluate and make changes. What work with one class or group might not work with another. Uh, remember, when leadership teams plan socials, often they're made up of more women than men. This is critical when you're planning your events. So understand, guys typically like things that don't talk as much, although I think men talk just as much as women, but the perception may not be that way. But Men typically plan, you know, sporting events, outdoor camping trips, service projects, and women typically create events that are more social based where we talk and, and and emotions and, you know, that kind of stuff. So be in mind when you plan a lot of things where you're worried about the tabletop decoration and the colors and that the punch matches the cake, guys don't care. Um, in fact, they probably won't come. And so I would rather plan an event that I know men, all men want to come to and know the women will show up. So keep that in mind, plan an event that all men would like, and then the women will come. So ax throwing, target shooting, outdoor, hiking, uh, fishing, sporting events, all these things, eating at restaurants that have real food, not little tapas. Men don't really like little teeny food. They want big food, big burgers. And then I promise you the women will come. But Getting men in our ministry is a whole nother talk. And I'm gonna tell you what, you gotta pray men and you gotta build relationships with men with men, but that's another talk. And I've got information on my website that can help you with that. Ephesians 4, 16 says, from whom the home body joined and held together by every joint from which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. 
And so we want to build teams. We want to build and be strategic in what we're doing. We want there to be a purpose behind our socials, and we want to see fruit that comes from them. You don't need anybody to plan your social life. You can pick up the phone, invite a few friends, and go do something. But when it comes to your ministry, when you plan a social, it needs to be strategic. You need to be thinking about why you're doing it. What's the purpose? Is there fruit? Is there value? Are people still invested? Is my team invested? Do I have a team? And pray, 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 pray. And if you decide, you know what, right now we're just going to stay focused on the Bible study and people can just talk to each other and plan things to do among themselves because they will, you know, when people do a Bible study, they usually say, what are you doing this weekend? Then just let them plan their own things. And you wait until you have the team that you need to plan a strategic social. So the rest of our time is going to be, um, uh, we can talk and we can share ideas, but the rest of that handout is a gazillion creative social events. So it's not just the normal stuff that everybody does, but I have been gathering ideas for 10 years at least and expanded upon them and there's a massive list here that you can go through and glean from. And if you have more, if you've done some of these and said, oh, I did that. It didn't work really well because I changed this. Or, hey, have you thought about this? Put it in the chat or email me. I can put my email address in there. Email me because I'll just add to it and it's free. I have this whole list free on my website so that you can, you know, as we keep getting more and more creative ideas, the more things we can put in there. So I hope you enjoyed this time and, and maybe you're, you're thinking differently about how to do your socials, right, Eileen? Yes, I think so. I thought it was interesting that you, and I didn't look through your list to see if axe throwing was on there. I'm going axe throwing on Friday night uh, yep. with, uh, I have family coming in and I lined it up. I've been once before. It is so fun. And, and I was telling somebody and they went, axe? I said, yeah. I mean, who knew? So <laughs> there's all kinds of adventures. I wanted to say it was actually uh, Spoonie. I'm thinking it might have been with your group at First Baptist. Uh, First Baptist in Houston, one of the largest singles ministries in the country. They have some really creative ideas. Definitely put a link, uh, Spoonie, to your um, church because they do movie nights right now with COVID. And that's probably the other thing. It's like, how do you do all this with COVID? Um, but they're doing movie nights and worship nights and game nights. And you can just Google Zoom games and tons of things come up because the whole goal is connecting people, you know, connecting the ones we already know. So people, we don't lose people. Um, because COVID has caused us to lose a lot of people, you know, they kind of fell off the radar and they're already not great on the radar when we were together, you know, because singles, you know, they, they don't come back to some of our things. We don't know what's happened to them, but, um, but we want to keep the existing folks connected, but then we also want to create a door. So we know that even though COVID, we hate it, we've been able to reach people that we never were able to reach before COVID. Right. Because so, online yeah. creates a safer way for me to connect. I don't even have to show my face and I can jump in on an event and that, you know, a game that you guys are doing. So Spoonie put on there that the, they've got that online game night figured out. So um, you can uh, go to their website, in, impactsingles.org. She put that information in the chat. And another thing I thought of is you could do a, a, a scavenger hunt in your own home on Zoom. Yep. If somebody comes up with the list and, you know, I, it would just be funny, you know, crazy items you, you think of that, you know, who has a baseball trophy from 1954? Yeah, you create a, a massive list. I've done everything from what's in your purse, your bag, your backpack, what's in your car, uh, how many weird things, how many things you have in your shower. Women always have about 25, 30 things in their shower and guys have four. Um, and it's just kind of fun to see, you know, the creativeness or look at your, your bookcase and go, how many of those books have you actually read all the way through, you know, and, and, uh, and just, you know, or everybody can make dinner and sit together and eat dinner and talk about whatever, or watch a movie and then sit and eat and talk about the movie. Um, I've literally, there's probably, you know, a hundred or more creative. These are creative. This is not just you know, go to dinner, but let's take it to the next level. And so I've been collecting them for quite a while. There's really, you know, you can go through the list. If you're not sure what one of them means, like, that's crazy. It's weird. Explain that like the appetizer hop. Um, it was a playoff of the old days of the beer hop. 
Okay, y'all, some of you might remember them old days. And so instead of going from place to place and drinking a beer, you go from place to place, you eat an appetizer. And people ask you, you don't sit down, you go to the bar and you just like, you know, at like a TJ Friday's or whatever, and you just order an appetizer. And everybody puts down a buck and you eat the appetizer and people say, well, what are you doing? Like a group of 10 of you, what are you doing? And you tell them we're from First Baptist or we're from Second Presbyterian or whatever. And we're doing this fun thing as a group of singles. And again, you can then have a brochure ready, have something to give out because you always want to have something to give out. When people ask, you can get their information and get their information too. So you can follow up and it's just, but it's fun, but it's also strategic in that you can reach people for the Lord. Yeah, um, and Baptists could say they'd been to a bar. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, well, yeah. Definitely, yeah. Uh, put some more information there about the, the digital scavenger hunt and things like that. And so really, Chris, even, I mean, these are things that people could do because of limited funds. They could do these, these kind of yes. things also. But what are some, are some of those ideas that you have in your list, you know, more geared to no funds, limited funds? Everything. That- I've thought of everything. I mean, if you just like, just going through the list, just generally, let's just go through. Um, I actually one of your lady, Stacy. Uh, um, Spoonie, Stacy, uh, not Eileen's friends, but uh, that's at First Baptist. She told me about this crazy idea where everybody was asked to bring an item to donate to a food shelter. You have to bring two items. So people brought, okay, I brought a can of beans and I brought, you know, a can of spam. And when they got to her house, she says, okay, I'm putting you in groups of two and you have to make the meal tonight using the food you brought. And they're like, I got spam and I got beans. And, and it was just, and then like somebody brought flowers, somebody brought sugar. And so they made a cake and, and she said it was so much fun and it was cheap. And she goes, but then we, I did have stuff to carry to the shelter. I don't want you to think I didn't have things, but I love that cre- that was kind of out of the box, really cheap to do. Um, uh, you know, cook cake, cup slot, uh, progressive dinner, breakfast, um, uh, serving breakfast for events normally designed for dinners such as Valentine's. I mean, you can do it, you know, that's not overly creative. Dinners for eight. I used to do dinners for seven and pick a theme from around the country. Now we'll talk about that country and what the Christians are going and doing in that country. Um, bake-offs. People love to bring their favorite chili and compete against each other. Um, let's see, cooking classes. You know, one of you might be a really good cook and the rest of us are terrible. And we could come and you could, you know, maybe at the church at the fellowship hall and you could teach some basics on how to cut up a, ro- a rib roast or something. Um, let's talk about, obviously, you ever heard of a mancation? <laughs> so a, man, a mancation is, is, a, is an event for men with all different physical things that men like to do from fishing to golfing and they eat large meals and they sit around, but it's a mancation. Um, encouraging our guys and growing our guys. Obviously, you know, we've seen the amazing race, fashion show for women, you know, women like that, um, any type of sport, Bible study. Uh, here's some ideas, you know, taking characters out of the Bible or dressing up like those characters. Uh, um, uh, karaoke, of course, has been around a long time. That's not nothing too interesting, but you could get a karaoke machine and do one in your house. You don't actually have to go to a bar where it's smoky or not smoky, but drinking. You can do it yourself. Um, form a group and learn sign language, the music. I love when people do the beautiful, the, you know, it's free, free. You can even do that online. How do I get people to help me do it? Well, that's the ownership part of going back. So you don't announce, Hey, we're going to have this event. And then hopefully people just show up and everybody's going to help you. Um, there might be two or three that will, because that's just in their heart but I don't want to just get two or three people and it's the same two or three people. So I build relationships with people and I build a team. So you have to build a leadership team that even if your leadership team is not the team over your Bible study or over the ministry, they're the team that does the social. And so they may say, well, I'll commit to doing one social a month. And that's the only thing I want to serve on. I don't want to do anything else. That's fine, but they have to commit and follow through. So having them uh, commit and follow through, they have to have ownership. So when coming up with the event, if I said to you, okay, we're going to do a scavenger hunt in the city, okay? And out of 10 people, eight of them are like, I don't want to do a scavenger hunt in the city. Well, then you don't do a scavenger hunt in the city. You ask them, what would you like to do? What interests you? And add, and then and have them understand that not everybody's going to get their way and not everybody may like it. But if the mindset is to reach people for Jesus, and that's what we should be doing, then hopefully they'll go along with it. 
And so if you say, hey, we're going to go serve water, you know, give out water bottles and hot dogs in the park. Well, what does that look like? Well, first, we probably need evangelism 101 class, just in case somebody does ask you, are you prepared to be able to share your faith? And then we're going to talk about what does that look like? Do we give out water bottles and put labels on them that say, welcome to First Baptist? Do we have wrappers and the hot dogs that the wrappers have the steps of salvation on them? You know, are we going to set up somewhere? Or are we going to walk around and give it out? Or do we have a license and a permit to give out food in the park? So all that is strategy and planning. But if you involve people, a handful of people in the planning, and they take ownership, and they have ideas, and you listen to their ideas, more likely they'll commit and follow through. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Uh, Spoonie has put some more information there uh, about something that she's working on. So some, if you're a scrapbooker, you might look on there, because that might be something that you could join her her Zoom, if you uh, email her, I'm sure she'd uh, be glad for you to be added there. Uh, but I don't have any other questions that have uh, yeah. come. This has been great information. And again, you'll find this webinar posted. Uh, when you get that notification, it will be posted. And that will mean that the other two that happened on Thursday night and Tuesday night are also posted. So uh, just be looking for that email to come to, to that email address that you gave. Now, I know, Eileen, you might have thought when you were going to be on this webinar that we were going to go through 150 different ideas for your ministry. <laughs> um, and as much as I would like to do that, and we can have a lot of fun doing that, um, I really felt that having all the ideas doesn't guarantee that you're going to have a good social. So I, that's why I just give you a list. You can read the list and decide for yourself. But if you don't know why you're doing the social, if you don't put strategy behind it, if you don't build a team then you're gonna get burned out. It's gonna be the same one or two people doing all the work. And it's just, you know, and I have people in our ministry that expect you to have socials, right? They're like, what are we doing this month? What are we doing this weekend? And they're always the ones that are doing nothing. They're always the ones that are not helping. They're not setting up, they're not cleaning up. And you'd like to think, why do I have to tell you? Why do I have to communicate that we need help? Well, you do. Now I'd like to think some of you are mature enough. You wouldn't be sitting on your butt the whole time when we have an event. And just going, well, gosh, look at all that work that has to be done. I'm glad I can just sit here. Um, I, you know, shame on you. Okay. But for me, I'll just ask you, I'm not going to sit there and boohoo about it and then complain afterwards. I really love doing socials. I love doing events. I love having fun. I love what comes out of a social. I love seeing lives change. I love reaching lost people, but I also don't want to exhaust myself and get burnt out. So if I don't, be strategic and ask people to help and tell them what's expected. When I don't ask people at the event, hey, would you get these chairs? Hey, would you get the trash and carry it off? If I don't do that, I'm not building the kingdom. I'm making it about Chris, what Chris wants. So I don't believe there's anywhere in the Bible that says that it's about me and, and fun for me. And although I want you as a guest to have fun, and I don't want you to feel like, oh gosh, every time Chris plans something, I got to work. Um, I don't want you to look at it that way. But I do want you to look at it as, wow, every time Chris has something, um, we see lives change. And I'm so glad that I get to help in that. And wow. so, you know, we try to find a balance somewhere. Right. Exactly. So, well, thank you so much for sharing this morning with us, uh, all of you. And uh, we will be back for our final webinar tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., I'm sorry, I don't know the Argentina time or the Wales or UK time. Isn't it 2.30? I believe it's 2. Is it 2? Okay, maybe I'll, yeah, it's, it, you're right, because it ends at 4.30 my time. You're right, yep. So um, for, for England, it is um, 8 to 9.30 in, uh, in England and Wales. In Argentina, Sylvia said that it's 11.41 there, so they're two hours ahead. Okay. So, um, we so let me just tell you, the leadership one is really important. It is how do we build our teams, which is going to help you answer some of the questions here. Max, you know, uh, Max is watching us, Eileen, and you've known Max probably as long as I've known him. Uh, Max, you know, we love your, any of your input, any of your ideas that you've had that you did with all your singles for many, many, many years uh, that was fun or strategy or definitely how to get more men involved because he had, he's next to a military base and he had a lot more guys than girls, I'm sure, but would love, you know, uh, input in, hey, Max, if you want to put a link to your publishing, uh, he's written uh, some books and he's written definitely one on singleness that may be of value and other and 
uh, those who don't know me as well, if you go to my website, thesinglesnetwork.org, thesinglesnetwork.org, you'll also see various books, Bible studies that I've written, um, and resources that will help you grow your ministry. And, hey, guys, it is, you know, I don't know everything. So, you know, you may have been a part of a ministry and you did some things that were great and awesome. Maybe you've written some articles. Maybe you have some suggestions, some websites, some links, some things that I need to know about that I need to add to my site. Maybe a book that you really loved. I mean, even today, Eileen, um, Pastor Steve Harris, a friend of mine, posted this article that a Christian wrote on why everybody is so angry right now. And, and what we're seeing online. And, you know, the reality is, guys, we're bombarded with so many messages all day long and our brains just explode. So planning a strategic fellowship where people can just breathe, just breathe, might be what we need to plan right now. So, you know what? Think about it. Pray about it. Make sure it's really what God wants. Don't let people pressure you into something you don't need to be doing. Okay? Right. Don't, don't do it because this church does it or this small group does it. You do what God wants you to do because there's a plan in it. Plan for success versus plan for failure. That's Weight Watchers. Give them a little plug. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, thank you again for being here. And uh, if you're going to be able to join us, we'll look for you tomorrow. If you're not, we're, we're sad to see you go. Um, but we're just glad that you're here. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to think about creative ways that we can engage people with the purpose of leading them to Christ, with the purpose to draw them in, to be a part of a ministry, to perhaps reconnect them to a life that they had uh, never fully developed, a relationship fully vested in you, Father. So, Father, I thank you for Chris, for her leadership during this time. I thank you for each of these participants, the time that they've spent this morning with us. And uh, we just appreciate what they're doing in their community and how these ideas are spreading new ideas in their mind and thinking about who they can connect with to, to develop these teams to do uh, a more fulfilling ministry in their own location. We thank you, Lord, for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.